Uh, so I think uh, rapid deployments, high velocity deployments, there's a real rush to get projects in the ground uh, and there's a, a real move to eliminate risk associated with every phase of the project from the construction uh, right through to the 20 or 30 year asset life and the operation and maintenance expenses associated with that. So all of this is, is moving along at a rapid pace. Uh, and then there are a whole host of technological changes uh, such as the adoption of bifacial modules, integration of energy storage that are uh, very exciting for the industry as well. Uh, so today, pricing has become very tight. So there's little margin for error for anybody involved right across the entire value chain. Uh, I think through uh, the school of hard knocks, differences in performance of solar panels, differences in performance of inverters have largely become priced in uh, to the asset selection. The same is not true uh, for a lot of the balance of system category components, such as the structures, the trackers, and the electrical balance of system components, which can very materially alter the value of those assets through the implications of reliability and long-term operation and maintenance expenses. And we think in this regard, in terms of what's currently being largely overlooked or mispriced, uh, and therefore what bears more scrutiny, um, this is what I would call people to uh, uh, seriously question and, and spend their time to do proper homework and due diligence. Uh, so solar trackers dramatically increase the energy output of a solar site and effectively they do a very simple thing. They keep the solar panels at 90 degrees to the angle of incidence of the sun. That increases the uh, flux of the, electro of the photovoltaic uh, generation capacity and increases the energy output over the course of the year the order of 20 to 30 percent. Uh, this is a function of insulation, how sunny it is in that location. It's also a function of latitude, uh, but those are the main differences. And today, uh, single axis trackers are not dramatically more expensive to construct than fixed tilt systems. So the energy performance increase is really dramatic and, and really pencils out very well. The only caveat I would draw your attention to is back to my prior point uh, that the, the operation and maintenance expenses of the single axis trackers have to be properly priced in and today that is not the case as there are some very large differences between the architectures of trackers which impact uh, that latter assumption. But other than that, uh, there's a very compelling reason uh, why single axis tractors should be used and their adoption is uh, right now 80% in utility scale projects in the U.S. So uh, they've really become very persuasive, uh, pervasive rather, and other parts of the world are following suit. So the two broad categories are single row trackers. Uh, those are ones where every row of modules is its own instance. It has its own motor and its own inclinometer and its own controller. And there's a whole category of providers that have used that architecture. Then there are what are called centralized trackers where you have some sort of mode of actuation that moves a multitude of rows without electronics in, in the individual rows. Uh, so those are really the two broad categories. Within the linked row architectures, uh, there are really a couple of alternatives. Uh, a largely outmoded approach where there's a push-pull where a, a large lever arm basically moves the panels together and that's it's very expensive uh, and also requires you to have very flat uh, terrain. Uh, there is also an approach using a drive line, which is very flexible. You can have uneven terrain and hills and you don't have to grade the site. Uh, and you also have much uh, lower construction costs, yet you have the benefit of an elimination of a lot of complexity and failure points and electronics in each of the rows. So those are really the, the, the broad uh, architectural alternatives that uh, customers can choose from today. Sure. So the differences are really profound. Uh, in a centralized tracker, uh, you typically will now, with the, and I'll uh, draw attention to the driveline approach, you'll have a single motor which can operate over 30 rows uh, by a rotating driveline and a gear mechanism uh, that allows that single motor to operate all of these other rows as opposed to the single row architectures where you have typically a backup battery, a power supply, an inclinometer, a control box, and a radio 
in each and every row. So on a 100 megawatt site, just to give you a rough idea, the uh, linked row architecture would have approximately 150 electromechanical components, whereas a single row architecture would have over 25,000. Uh, so it's really a, an incredible differential in terms of the complexity of, of those deployments. Uh, and we believe that that strongly predicts uh, that the O&M costs, the operation and maintenance costs, will be very, very much higher over the life cycle of the asset for the complex ones uh, versus the simple ones because there's just simply so much more that has to be maintained and so many more failure points and so forth. Uh, on top of that is the approach to managing wind events. Uh, so obviously these are utility scale sites that are deployed all over the world. Uh, you can have high wind events and the structures obviously have to be designed to withstand the high wind events without hurting the panels or hurting the structures. So the single row uh, architectures rely on stowing. So you detect that a wind event is coming and you rotate those panels into a stow position at a relatively low angle so that they don't have to bear or the force of the wind. The problem with that approach is that if anything goes wrong in a complicated chain of command, you don't stow and therefore you are vulnerable to uh, a mechanical failure. In the case of the linked row architectures, the approach to wind management is, is entirely passive, where clutches allow the panels to rotate and just shed the wind forces with no intelligence involved, nothing to go wrong, and then the panels are supported at each of the posts down the 90 meter length of the row. So there are really, really profound differences between the two architectures that uh, have very major financial ramifications over a predicted 20 to 30 year asset life. So for a lot of the reasons that I've, I've been discussing, uh, the, the reliability and operation and maintenance costs of the structures uh, and the electrical connectors and balance of system components can really profoundly impact the levelized cost of energy. So all of these systems properly maintained produce electrical energy, assuming that there aren't any catastrophic failures. But the name of the game is to have those sites operate reliably over 20 to 30 years without people touching them and without truck rolls occurring and paying the labor costs and the replacement component costs. Uh, so if your output is largely a fixed uh, item and your O&M costs are something that have to be predicted and managed over the life cycle of the, of the plant, uh, this can really, really move the needle on how valuable those sites are. Uh, and we believe that the, the difference in tracker selection alone uh, can be the order of 6 to 7 percent uh, in terms of a difference in levelized cost of energy uh, over the life of the asset. And that is largely ignoring uh, propensity for more catastrophic failures where the structures are becoming damaged and wind events and panels are, are being damaged and things of that nature. So we think this is largely overlooked. It would be if you were buying a home and you, you, you focused on the, the wallpaper in the paint and you, you didn't do a, an inspection of the foundation or the roof, um, it's really on that sort of level that the, the balance of system is, is really the, the fundamental underpinning of the asset itself. And yet for whatever reason today, and it's perhaps a function of the immaturity of the market, uh, the panels get a lot of scrutiny, the inverter gets a lot of scrutiny, but the very important electrical connections and the electrical balance of system and the structures receive actually relatively little attention today. And, and you know, we think this is something that's going to get sorted out over the next few years. Warren Buffett had a quote, uh, and his quote was that if you're playing in a poker game uh, and you've been playing for half an hour and you haven't figured out who the patsy is in the poker game, you're probably the patsy. And I think it's really very true of solar asset investing today, uh, where some of the things that I've previously been talking about are obviously not front and center in the discussion, and the operation and maintenance variables are often not reflected in the financial models. And there's a wholesale outsourcing of some of that due diligence uh, to independent engineering firms 
who frankly are not being compensated to take those risks uh, and are not bearing any reliability or liability rather for those outcomes. So it really is, I think, an age of buyer beware, uh, where uh, desktop diligence alone does not get it done. Uh, if you're looking to lend against um, an existing site or buy an existing site, I would strongly suggest uh, you know, a monitoring program where you're actually looking at what is going on on the facility, who's there, how many people are roaming around the place maintaining it. Because people that are used to investing in traditional generation assets look at only the output of the asset and go, well, my combined cycle plant is producing energy or it's not. And it's not the same for solar. Normally, if you're, if you're following an O&M protocol, regardless of how expensive, the output of the site will maintain its constancy and do what it's supposed to do. The question is, what does it cost to keep it doing that over the course of the life of the asset? And are you properly taking that into account when you're making your loan against that site or you're putting your equity uh, to acquire the site? And so, so to me, it is, is early enough in the evolution of this market. We've seen this play out in wind, uh, where initially the wind market was quite indiscriminate. And then over time, uh, certain turbine manufacturers proved to be uh, wholly unreliable and too expensive to maintain. And there were bankruptcies and asset impairment and lots of things happened. Uh, and it's early innings for solar. Solar is relatively young, in particular the adoption of, of single axis trackers. Uh, dual axis trackers, this played out in a very poor way in Europe uh, 10 years ago, uh, and a lot of the those uh, assets couldn't be maintained and became very expensive fixed tilt systems. Uh, and that was really to the detriment of the people that acquired those sites or lent against them. And so I think there's this very real risk today. The optimist in me, though, says that we're going to move through this pretty quickly, um, that the market's going to mature and single axis trackers are a, a fantastic technology. Uh, if done right, they pencil out very, very well. Uh, and this indiscriminate uh, pricing of the of the O&M costs into the models is not that big a deal to sort out. There just has to be a buyer beware brought to uh, uh, to the to the fore and uh, people will sort this out. So I'm quite confident that this is all going to end well, although there may be some uh, you know tears and and uh, bad projects along the way.